And, and we are live. Hello. <laughs> Hello to Sylvia Lou. Wow, what a great, what a great opportunity to meet you. We've been communicating for years. Uh, you are very famous in the children's literature movement, I'm going to say, uh, co-creator of Kidlet 411, together with our friend Elaine Kylie Kearns. Did I get that right? Yes, that's right. Hello, Mel. Thanks for hey, inviting Sylvia. me. Sylvia. Wow. And, and uh, we're celebrating because uh, you have a new, a new book just out a couple of weeks ago. That's correct. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad to be here. <laughs> oh, I should say where here is. So <laughs> I forgot. I'm Mel Rosenberg, and I'm the host of the Children's Literature Channel for the New Books Network. And my guest is the splendid Sylvia Lu. So uh, Sylvia, show everybody who can see uh, your brand new book. Hi, yes, I am calling in from uh, Virginia, and this is my new middle grade science fiction book, Hannah Shu and the Ghost Crab Nation. It came out a month ago, and it's um, a fast-paced, adventurous sci-fi, and the premise is that 30 years in the future, um, kids, when they turn 13, get their brains connected to the internet, but it's called the multi-web, and my uh, main character is Hannah, and she's like a kind of an old soul and she um, tinkers and says so she has a lot of connections with like manual and non like virtual stuff, but she ends up getting excited, um, planning to get meshed. And but she discovers a corporate conspiracy against her class of kids. And so then the, the venture is off. <laughs> and there's all kinds of cyber animals involved, cyber bees to the rescue. Yes, uh, there are cyber bees and there are bird bots. And um, I put in a lot of um, Chinese cultural influences because in this near future world, it's very Chinese influences influence. So there's lots of like Chinese food in the story and also like um, Qigong, which is like sort of a, you know, a meditative practice comes into play as well. So people, people are going to ask whether uh, you think that China is going to take over the cyber world in 30 years. Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the the premise of the story, it, you know, like cyberpunk really talks about how corporations kind of take over. And so um, if you ever watch movies like Blade Runner, you know, that's like the idea. And so I kind of just did that, but in a middle grade friendly way. So yes, the corporations, um, you know, have taken over and one of the Chinese corporations is one of the biggest ones. <laughs> Right. Um, and we won't talk too much more about it. It's a wonderful book. Highly recommend it. It's for kids from about 8 to 12. Yes, that's correct. But even and like it, I would say old, slightly older, 13, 14 would enjoy it. Okay. And and uh, yes, very enjoyable. And and uh, it's published by Razorbill, which yes. is an imprint of Penguin Random House. Yes, that's correct. So I, I'm thinking you have a lot of uh, seaside creatures in this. <laughs> um, yes, you, you there have, are. You have the crabs and the penguins. Yes, <laughs> that's true. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I have a. I love the ocean. That's um a theme in my whole life, actually. <laughs> okay, so now this is supposed to segue to your whole life. Okay. So you're an ocean girl, but tell us about your life, Sylvia. Um. Well, so for many of you who know, but some may not know, I actually um, grew up abroad in South America. Um, I was born in Chicago. My parents originally were from China, but they immigrated to the United States, met in the United States, had my sister and I. But when we, when I was five, I moved to Venezuela, um, Caracas, and I grew up uh, there. For, 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 for qué? <laughs> por qué? <laughs> because my dad was a civil engineer who worked on dams hydroelectric dams and his company was an american ah, company that so was, was my so well, hold on so was my okay. late father oh really <laughs> he was a civil civil engineer in canada who worked on dams oh, what, where did he work in what, canada what, what, i know what company uh it was called the canadian government oh okay oh okay yeah so my dad's company was a called harza engineering company but they were hired by the venezuelan government to help them design a series of dams so my parents were there for 23 years. So I was there basically throughout my you know, kindergarten through senior year of high school. 
then I came back to the US for college and law school. Then I became an environmental lawyer working on ocean conservation. That's where okay, ocean is Sylvia, coming. We're, we're moving too fast here. Um, <laughs> so what was Sylvia, the five-year-old, like? Oh, I was super shy. <laughs> um, I was very, very shy all through elementary school until about like, I would say fourth, fifth grade. And then somehow something happened and then I became much more outgoing. And by the time I ended up graduating from, from high school, I was like student council president. <laughs> you were you you were somehow enmeshed. Yes. <laughs> to, to quote your own book. Uh, by the way, this whole idea of getting enmeshed at 13 because I'm Jewish, so I take it as a metaphor for bar mitzvah. Yeah, so. it was sort of like a rite of passage. I kind of did think about that. Um, my husband is Jewish, so, you know, that ah, sort of- I didn't, I didn't know that. Yeah, so, but, but also 13 seems to also like when you become a teen, right? From 12 to 13, so. <laughs> okay, so five-year-old and, and you were being moved around. I mean, you grew up in Chicago and then yeah. all of a sudden you're in Caracas. Right. Speak, and, speaking a whole different language. Right. Well, it's funny because when my parents got transferred to Caracas, they didn't even know where Venezuela was. They had to go to a library and ask a librarian to show them <laughs> where it was. Um, we didn't think we were going to be there that long. So they we went to American schools because at first it was just a short contract. And so um, the people, the kids who were, went there were very international, you know, all sorts of, you know, from all over military, um, em embassies, multinationals. But so they came and went every few years, but there was just a small group of us that stayed like in the entire time. So I was there, you know, 12 years. Wow. Uh, and then when you went to this, when you went back to the States, what did you study as an undergraduate before law school? Um, I, uh, I actually went to Yale and I studied economics and political science. Um, and I was interested for a time in becoming a journalist. So, you know, that was sort of my undergraduate idea. But then I got interested in environmental issues and wanted to like sort of be what I thought was more effective. And so I decided to go to law school. So I went to law school with the idea of doing environmental law. But, you know, law school training doesn't really focus on specific topics. You just you know, at least like first year you do all the basics and then, you know, and then you can specialize a little bit. So when did this uh, bug of uh, fixing the world <laughs> infect you? Um, I don't really know. I think growing up in Caracas, Venezuela, I was outdoors a lot, you know, so I, the, my love of the environment came from there. We'd love the oceans, the mountains, you know, Caracas is a beautiful valley. Um, and I think when I went to college, you know, that's when you meet people who are like very idealistic, passionate. And one of my closest friends and roommates was a huge environmentalist. So she probably had a big influence on me. <laughs> and then you went to law school. Yes. Where did you go to law school? Uh, I went to Harvard Law School. Um, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so and that's- you, gra you graduated Harvard Law School. Sorry? This is crazy. You graduated Harvard Law School? Yes, I did. Okay. So, and then after that, I spent one year in California working for a judge, uh, a district court judge. So I was a clerk. And then after that, I came back to Washington, D.C. to um, work at the Department of Justice doing environmental law. So I was doing appellate work and policy and legislation. So it was lots of very fun stuff. And it was under the Clinton administration at that time. Which means? Which means that it was a progressive and liberal versus like, it, when when uh, when Bush came to power, um, I decided to quit that job and I went to a nonprofit to work on ocean conservation. So- And you, you did that for how long? And I did that for four years. And, um, and then after that, um, that was around the time when my kids were young. Um, my, when my kids were three and one, I decided to stay home with them and try my hand at another lifelong love I've always had, which was art. So growing up, I did a lot of painting. And in college, I took a lot of art classes. And even when I was a lawyer, I would take night classes at the Smithsonian, you know, and one of the classes I took was actually a children's illustration class with uh, Nina Layden, who is a very well known illustrator and author. Um, and so that sort of sparked my interest. And I decided, okay, I'm going to try to become a children's illustrator. 
And at that time, um, I had two small kids and I thought, you know, oh, I'll have plenty of time to work on my <laughs> career. But no, when you have two toddlers, you don't have plenty of time. So, you know, I really only had time in their like 20 minute naps to try to get a career going, <laughs> my second career. And what, and what, and a less lucrative career than your first. Yes. <laughs> and then, um, and then about a year after I, I quit my job, my husband got a job in um, Southeast Virginia where I live now. And so we moved to Virginia beach. And so um, then I just continued, you know, my efforts. And so basically, um, as I was trying to learn more about children's illustration, I started writing picture books. And that led to my first book that I actually read, uh, wrote, which is A Morning with Grandpa. And then that kind of um, ended up, you know, like veering me more towards writing versus illustrating. Okay. What, tell us about A Morning with Grandpa. Yeah, so Morning with Grandpa um, is published by Lee and Low Books, and I actually got it published through the New Voices Award Program. I don't know if you've heard of that, um, but, you know, every year they are looking for new, um, diverse, you know, talent. And so I submitted. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about, and I'm sure you've heard about, is like at that time, and I'm still um, part of it, there's a great picture book community called 12 by 12. Um, and it is uh, 12, the 12 by 12 challenge. And basically it's a great community of picture book authors who aim to draft one picture book a month. And it was founded by Julie Headland. Julie Headland has been, has been on the show. Oh she's yes. Wonderful. She's wonderful. And I, I told her that I have trouble writing uh, only one a month. So I'm I'm not a good candidate. I write one one every two weeks. I I, I, I we need... should average out because I only did like one every two months. <laughs> we should, we should. So so um and and then so did you get an agent to represent you? Well, so um I submitted that uh, manuscript and won that year, and so the prize was publication. But I didn't have an agent at the time. I was looking for an agent for my picture books. Um and you know querying is a long and hard slog. <laughs> And um, during that time, I made a really great um, critique group, which is where I met Elaine, Kylie Kearns. And it was that time when we started Kid Lit 411, which we'll probably talk about in a bit. <laughs> um, probably. <laughs> but um, yeah, so then I, at the time, I also started taking classes in a local writing center um, called the Muse Writers um, Center, which now has online classes, but at the time was only local and in person. But that's sort of where I really learned how to write novels because I got really interested in writing longer forms. And so I had, you know, I wrote a middle grade novel that hasn't gone anywhere. But then my second idea was um, the Hannah Shoe idea. So I worked on that for a, a while. And so I queried Hannah Shoe and got my agent, Jennifer March Soloway, who is amazing. <laughs> um, Inc incredible. For, the, for that. And then while we were submitting Hannah Shoe and the Ghost Crab Nation, that's when um, she sold um, this other book that I have, Manatee's Best Friend. Um, and that's a book with Scholastic. And it's a book about a 12-year-old girl in Florida who wants to save manatees, but she's extremely shy. And there's also some um, you know, complications like a viral video that she ends up, you know, things kind of blow up for her. <laughs> It's, and I'm guessing that there's something autobiographical in both of these novels. Um, yeah, I always put in a little bit of myself and my my kids always are very like, they're like, mom, why'd you do like, they'll, they'll read like a, a meal that we eat all the time. They're like, why'd you put that in? <laughs> they, they, think, they're yeah. embarrassed that you put it in or they want yeah, you to put it in? I think they're a little embarrassed. They're teenagers, you know, <laughs> so, but I they always say, oh, you know, this is so much like you, you know, in different parts of the book. So yes, I do put a lot of myself in my books. <laughs> and let's go back to grandpa. Uh, can you show us uh, some of the spreads? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. And it's so a this, it, um, it's a when beautiful I, book. Yeah, it's illustrated by Christina Forshave. She did a great job. And um, I, when I sent um, my editors a picture of my dad, actually, he has a very similar, um, like, haircut and look. So I think she maybe could have been um, inspired by it. I don't know. So anyway, so 
the idea of this book is um, this Chinese grandfather teaches his Chinese granddaughter um, Tai Chi, um, which is that slow moving, you know, um, exercise you sometimes see people doing in the parks and stuff, but she's too frisky and hyper. And then she turns around and teaches them yoga, but he's too old and creaky, but they end up having a great time. It's wonderful. Uh, when did that book come out? That came out in 2016. So it's been six years now. Okay, so now I think is a good time to segue back to um, to Kitlet 411. I mean, you have changed together with Elaine. You've changed the universe. Uh, you've uh, made it possible for 15,000 authors, wannabe authors, uh, illustrators, editors uh, to come together over a website that more incredibly this a marvelous Facebook group. Oh, well, thank you so much. Um, it was a brainchild of my friend, Elaine Kylie Kearns. Um, as I mentioned, we met each other. Um, we're, we're part of an online picture book critique group that uh, we started about 10 years ago through the 12 by 12. And we're still all great friends. We still share, you know, works with each other. And um, so at the time, you know, we there, there's lots of resources, even back then, tons of resources for children's illustrators and writers. Like I would say five or seven years before that, you know, like 15 years ago, things were a little bit harder when I was first trying to become a children's illustrator because there was a SCBWI, but there were things that you had to join and there weren't that many free resources. And so what happened is her idea was just, obviously there's a lot online, right? You can Google anything, but her idea was, you know, anytime we found a good article, we would like just put it in one central location and then, um, and I joined her. And so we basically like developed this website that just gathers, you know, hundreds and now thousands of links to articles and it's organized by topics. So there's like craft articles on writing, there's uh, industry articles on querying or, you know, finding an agent, there's um, specific grade level topics, you know, middle grade, YA, picture books, graphic novels, things like that. So it's a quite pretty comprehensive now. And then the other thing we figured out that was a nice thing to do was to just showcase or spotlight other kidlit creators. So every week we interview an author or an illustrator or both, um, usually two. And so, um, and we promote their recent books. And so and then, then um, out of that, we, we developed the Facebook group that's just been growing steadily every year. Um, it now has, as you mentioned, 15,000 members. And it's just a like a water cooler. You can all conversation. People ask questions about craft or industry or whatever, you know, and, and it's a very lively community. And we have two offshoots, which you probably know about, but not everybody does. Um, there's one called the Kidlit 401 Manuscript Swap Group, where people can find critique partners to, to share their work with. And then a similar one for illustrators called Kidlit 401 Portfolio Swap. So um, you are really busy. <laughs> how, how, how many hours does Kidlet 411 take a week? Well, at this point, Kidlet 411, we have a system pretty much. So, um, you know, every like couple months I send out, we, 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 we already have our author's book till the end of the year, basically. So we send out the questionnaires and then they come in. And so each week, you know, between Elaine and I, you know, I think we each work a couple, two to three hours probably on the site. So, you know, it it's very consistent, but it's not, you know, an ordinate amount. <laughs> and you've done a, a remarkable job. Thank so you. Let, let, let's let's so let's spill the beads for a few moments because I'm guessing that you are one of the most knowledgeable people who are on the writing and illustrating side, okay? And I'm gonna say something and I want you to agree or, or disagree. Okay, now I'm a little nervous. <laughs> no, don't be nervous. You can, you can say, Mel, you're full of beans. I'm gonna contend that agents receive thousands of submissions a year each. Oh yeah, of which, a thousand, I'm sure. <laughs> no, a, a few thousand. Yeah. Uh, of which they take on a very small amount of new clients, maybe two or three. That's probably true. 
So it depends on where the agent is in their career as well. You know, if they're starting out, they'll probably take on more, but as okay, they get more established, yeah. Okay. So the agents that we aspire to work with, um, our chance of getting published is um, about one in a thousand. And what, I mean, you can improve your chances. I, I've spoken to Harold Underdown about this a zillion times. And Harold says that you know, if you're a really good writer, you can increase your chances tenfold. And I say, oh, Harold, that's really great. It's still one in a hundred. So what, what do you do? What do we do to tell our community that it's, it's extremely difficult to become a published author or illustrator? You know, I do think it's very difficult, right? I think as the baseline, you have to write really well or draw and illustrate really well you have to have a professional level you know like product but that by itself isn't necessarily enough you just mentioned right how do you set your professional product aside you know apart from everybody else's right and that's actually a little bit why we started kid lit for when like i really do believe and it's just like the way to success in almost every industry is the idea of networking right put yourself out in the community that you want to be in, right? And so, like, even if you're introverted, there's ways to do it, right? And especially now with online um, social media, there's ways to do it where you don't even have to show your face or, you know, or your voice. Um, but really, you know, make your, like, like, find your communities, right? And so it could be writing classes. It could be, you know, a group like Kid Lit for One or 12 by 12. Um, as you get to know other people, and you're not even trying to network with people who are established or well known. You know, you're not trying to like get in good with like you know Kate De Camilla or whatever, right? What you're doing is you're meeting other people at your level who are as serious as you are. And if you like, for example, create a critique group with them, the 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 like the group effort of making each other better through critique each, each other works, each other's works by supporting each other by promoting each other when something, you know, is, 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 you know, happens that's good. All of that is how people like sort of make a name for themselves within the community. And, you know, and agents kind of like will pay attention to like, do you have a little bit of a, it's not really a buzz, but are you involved in the community? Do you, um, you know, and just the fact that you're, you know, they like, for example, like the, the pitch, the Twitter pitch parties and things like that, right? Um, the pitches that kind of come up to the top are really great pitches, but sometimes they're also the pitches where people, you know, are there that are boosted a lot because they have a, a community around them. So, so all I'm saying is that networking is one of the factors that you can help influence, you know. That, that's really good advice. Um, sometimes I want to pull my hair out when I see some posts uh, of our, in, our, uh, in our group. Uh, of people who don't understand that you have to be really good and persevere and that you have to appreciate that the chances are small. The people that I interview, like you, Sylvia, are one in 10,000, right, who have, who have done the right thing, whatever that, whatever that right also, thing is. You know, there's, there's definitely, like, luck and opportunity, of, you know, involved, like, are you in the right place? Is the work that you're doing at the right, like, like part of the zeitgeist, you know what I mean? You know, like people aren't looking for a certain type of books now, but maybe yeah, they're but, looking but for so that. Yeah, yeah. Let, let's, say, let's say that's a given. You have to have a manuscript that people think is going to sell. Right. <laughs> um, whether it will or not. And most do not become big blog, blockbusters. Um, and so there is luck and opportunity, and you have to be ready for the opportunity. But people have to realize that it's you just don't take a piece of paper and a pen and become a writer right yeah and, and then i also want to add a little bit to what i said about networking i don't mean it in a sense of like very transactional you know what i mean i feel like you really need to genuinely want to connect with other people you know like you and i have talked for years right and we're friends and now it's great to I, chat. <laughs> it's it's wonderful and so it's that kind of connection, you know, that like 
we'll talk and something, a project may come from it or whatever, you know what I mean? And it's not so much like, oh, if I retweet you, you retweet me, you know, it's not that kind of transactional thing. It really isn't. It's like, um, I will help you. And then if I'm lucky, you will help me or somebody else will help me. I, I found in my, in my careers that when you help people, you get lots more help back. Right. Exactly. It's now I'm curious, question. what are your careers? What have you? No, no, no you're not going to interview me today. <laughs> <laughs> we can set we can set up another interview if you like, but I'm not. My okay. my, my job is to talk about you. All right. Um, so these are really good pieces of advice. Um, what other things can you tell us? Um, let me ask you this question. Lots of people on Kidlit four one one, and now in SCBWI. Uh, are talking about self-publishing. Mm -hmm. I think, and I'm talking from experience, self-publishing is a good way to become poor. It's a good way to publish books that are not at a high level and to spend a fortune doing it and then to be bitterly disappointed. Your comment. Well, I am not so cynical about that. <laughs> I do think that um, you have to go into it with your eyes open. I actually have experience with self-publishing as well, because this year, earlier this year, I helped my dad self-publish his memoir. And I did do it like very professionally, you know, with like professional layout and cover design and editing and copy editing. So it did cost money for sure. Um, but I do feel like the product that came out was very, you know, like professional. So okay, but, but that's not ones. that's not that's not a book necessarily that uh, you expect everybody to buy. Yeah, no, no, it was definitely for family, and and, and it's a historic. There is a historical relevance, so it's for like you know certain history, World War II, you know, people. Um, but I do think like I have seen very successful children's book um, self publishers, but there are people who either have the skills, right, the graphic design skills, um, the, you know, the, or they've hired them. And because the thing is, once you go into self-publishing, you're not just the author or the illustrator, you're also the publisher, the marketer, the distributor, et cetera, et cetera, right? And sometimes people do these hybrid programs where, you know, an outfit will say, oh, we'll take care of all that, right? for a low, low price of $10,000 or whatever, right? And so that I don't really think is necessarily a great idea because I feel like if you really want, well, I guess it's, I'm not gonna say that because everybody has reasons to self-publish. And if you really just want to have a book out there and you have money to spend and you wanna you know, have it for your legacy or your family, or you're in a niche you know, area that you know, mainstream publishers don't want for sure, um, but I also think that many people can do it a lot like better themselves than going to a company that just is a turnkey. You know what I mean? Ah, uh, yeah. No, we're not. We're not talking about these shyster companies that, that just want to milk people with uh, vague promises that don't come true. Right. Uh, these vanity presses. Uh, but even if you want to publish yourself, um, I, I'm going to agree with you um, with one with one caveat. I'm using a legal term today. <laughs> um, and that, that is that if, if you say to yourself, okay, I want to publish a book. I know it's not going to be so great. Um, and I know that I might not sell so much, but I want it for my children and my cousins. Yeah, that's wonderful. The problem is, and I suffered from this before I met you. And before I came to SCBWI, I thought I was a really good writer. I thought I was a really good writer, and everybody who writes uh, thinks they are, and most are not, and I, I wasn't. So I had this wake-up call seven years ago in New York at the SCBWI, and I, I realized that I had a lot to learn. There's a lot of authors who do not understand that, and they think that they're rejected for this and the other reason. They don't realize that they're rejected because 99.9% .9 are. Yeah. And, and it's and the way, not necessarily that they're bad writers. It's just that their their writing doesn't fit with the current like market for, for example, picture books, right? Like are very short now, um, very like tight, under five hundred words. But you know, if you grew up reading, you know, Lyle Lyle Crocodile, that's probably like fifteen hundred words. You know, and so if that's your idea of a picture book, and you wrote 
a similar story, it just won't sell. And even nowadays, even if you self-publish it, people won't have the patience for it. You know what I mean? So that you, you do need to, as I agree with you, you need to like at least know what is currently selling, even if you go into self-publishing. I, I think that you're too kind. <laughs> uh, almost all of the self-published children's books that I see uh, are lacking in various in various uh, aspects that no traditional publisher would ever uh, uh, allow. Um, and um, let's leave this right now. Okay. Um, let's talk about you. What are you. What are your plans for the future? Well, I'm working on a middle grade fantasy right now. Um, it is um, influenced by Chinese uh, mythology. So that's been exciting. And um, I have another project that I can't really talk about. So um, yeah, so, so more of the same, you know, in, in writing, basically. <laughs> okay, how, how do you feel? I mean, you, you went to law school at Harvard. First of all, undergraduate at Yale, studied economics, went to Harvard. I'm sure you graduated with good marks. Um, and then you went and, and did a clerkship with a judge. Then you worked with the government, with the Department of Justice, and then you dropped it all and said, oh, you know what? I want to make illustrations and write books. How, how, how did your husband, what did people say? What did your well, family say? It was great did because you, I tell my, you, you dropped out. It's funny because my, um, my parents and my spouse, my kids have always been super supportive. So it's been great. It's sort of the acquaintances who like, look at me like, wait a minute, what are you doing? You know, you're the most well-educated, like, you know, what or illustrator wannabe <laughs> that I know. Um, but it's sort of funny because like going into college um, and while I was in college, I really was debating or I really wanted to major in art. So I actually always had this like artistic creative side, but being the child of immigrants and um, it wasn't just so much their, you know, like values. It was sort of like my own self-imposed, like, oh, I've got to do well. I've got to, you know, like succeed traditionally. So actually at the time, I actually in my mind said, okay, I'll give like law and law school like 10 years till I'm 40. And then I'll, then after that, I'll, I've fulfilled my obligations to society, um, not 40, sorry, 10 years till 30. And then yeah. at 30, I'll be able to like, just be completely, you know, um, you know, free to be creative. But, you know, once I got into my career in law school, I got, and, and once I got into my career, I just loved it. I really enjoyed doing what I did. And so my career ended up going past my 30 <laughs> mark. So it was more like in my mid thirties that I was able to well, like early, you know, to mid thirties that I did the switch. So in my mind, I was still on my life plan, but, <laughs> but it, it was kind of a, I guess, unconventional story. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And um, there must've been a period before you, became one in 5,000 of published authors where you were a struggling query writer. Yeah, I mean, the whole time I was writing picture books, I was struggling query writer because picture books is very hard to sell actually, um, especially if you're just writing or, you know, at the time I was trying to write and illustrate. And that's also, that's doubly hard obviously because you need to be at the highest level in both, right? And as a querying author illustrator, um, putting together a dummy takes a really long time because you're working on the entire book, but with images as well. So um, that entire time I was writing picture books um, was tough. Um, I got the kind of a lucky break with my Lee and Loeb book. Um, so that gave me some credibility, but it wasn't until I started writing middle grade and I think it was my middle grade voice and that really was like I found my niche and so that actually I could tell once I started writing those stories that I would have more success in that so and I did it, it, it's incredible because it's even like um I, I you know I, I I went through your book and it's like for me it's like an oive thing I say there's like I don't know 150,000 words there uh, not it, that many 60 5,000, I think it was, that's well, about. <laughs> well, I, I stopped counting at 20,000. There's, there's many, many words in this book. And 
So you've, you've written picture books. And so I need you here to comment on this. Um, you know, a picture book, it's nowadays 500 words or less. Um, and it can take you years to write it. But, and you know, sometimes you go through 50 or 70 drafts as, as I have, um, but it, it's still only 500 words. Right. <laughs> but think about if you've done 50 or 100 drafts of 500 words, you've already written <laughs> 50,000 words. So no, but basically, yeah, <laughs> I think writing picture books sometimes is harder because it's like writing a poem, right? You have every word counts. Do, do you think that really? I looked at your book and I said, wow, you are such a driven. This was before I knew about Yale and Harvard. <laughs> Sylvia is such a driven individual. I think like, I, I think, well, I just, sorry, my book just fell on the floor. Um, I think if you have read books your whole life, if you're an avid novel reader, you've like already like sort of soaked in a lot of lessons in writing novels. So like a lot of people, um, when they first write their first novel, you know, you just like spew out your words. You don't quite know how to organize it yet, how to make it like interesting and pace you know the pacing correct or the make the characters but there will be lots of elements you just kind of know you know how like dialogue works and looks like you know you know what descriptions look like and so you basically um you know obviously you can't just write for the first time and have it be you know perfect but you're going to, you know, read a lot, you know, go to classes, get critiques, etc. But I think the basics, there's a lot of it already inside of you. So I, I think that you just said the, the most lovely thing that, you know, if, if your heart and your skills are with middle grade books, then it's not a piece of cake, but it's, it's doable. Right. Whereas, whereas I am stuck at the age of five and I, you know, I, I think picture books are the most wonderful. Yeah, I, no, say, I, do, I do sort of feel like for children's authors um, that sort of what your inner child is, is like the age you write for, <laughs> you know? I think that totally. <laughs> I need that in writing. <laughs> I so believe that. So, yeah. so you write to your 10 year old self. Yeah, my 12 year old self. Yeah, 10, 12 year old self. Yeah, like kind of. That was the age when I just loved to read and I was just, you know, living in books like sci-fi, yeah. adventure, mystery, thrillers, um, everything I could get my hands on. And then once I went to high school and college, I actually probably stopped reading for a really long time outside of classwork, you know, and then it wasn't yeah. until I was an adult that I had more time again to read. Yeah, there's, there's another thing we should talk about. I mean, your book is full of science and, uh, and technology. Yeah. <laughs> That's incredible. So it's funny because I don't have a science background. My sister yeah. is the one who she she became a genetic like biology like science like she has a PhD. And so I did consult with her, but I've always like felt like if you are like well read and curious, you can understand a lot of science. Like I have a a subscription to Scientific American because I'm just interested in it, even though I've never, like after high school, I never took another science class except one in college, you know? And so, um, but I've, I'm just interested in reading about it. And then also the 10 years I was an environmental lawyer, I had to learn about the underlying science and environment, you know, whatever the case was. So you just have this like kind of, I guess, growth mindset that I can learn it, you know, um, if I, you know, if someone explains it in simple enough terms, I can understand it. So, um, and then because it's science fiction, I really rely heavily on the fiction side of it, right? You can make up things. <laughs> so, but, but a lot of what was in my book was really based in science, like, you know, the idea that you can mesh brains with the internet is actually being studied. And they there was um, an experiment where scientists did that with mice. Um, they actually put a little mesh in the mice's brains and they connected them together. It wasn't wireless, it was literally through wires. Um, I mean, that's very cruel to the animals, but people are studying that, you know? So, so I don't know, maybe 30 years from now we will be meshed and we'll be chatting like via our well, looking, <laughs> looking at your book, I did have all kinds of thoughts. 
And um, so maybe this will be my parting uh, question. This has been wonderful. Um, so the, last week, I was toying with a website, which uh, it's an uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, website where you put down a few keywords and it writes you a uh, blog, an article. Oh. <laughs> untouched, like, by, untouched by human hands. So about that topic. Yeah. And, you know, I had another oy vey moment. Um, it was really good. Completely, completely done by a computer. Right. Well, I've seen uh, those with artwork too, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. So it's, it's like yeah. fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the second half of my question. So just this morning, I, I was talking to somebody saying, you know, humans are going to be superfluous in 30 years. Um, a computer will be turning out uh, novels and thrillers. And you should excuse me, science fiction, picture <laughs> books. It's going to be an oy vey world. I mean, our job is just going to be buying books that were written by computers. Your comment, please. <laughs> save me, save me. I sure hope not. I hope that we as humans are bringing something different and special to the table. <laughs> you know, I mean, the thing is a lot of what the current AI is doing, though, is that it's mining existing human content, like even the artwork, it's taking existing art, you know, and so it's really relying on the basis of it is human, you know, creativity. So hopefully we will always be around. <laughs> yeah, we'll be around, but we'll be a, a little bit drivers, right? <laughs> no, a, a little bit like your book. We're going to be enmeshed, maybe. <laughs> and and I, I think that we already are. We we are, uh, you know, we are already the um, the servants of these uh, of these phones. Oh, I agree. I mean, I feel like even myself. Like, can you go a day without your phone? I'm not sure I could really. <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> so so Sylvia, hold up your wonderful new spooky book. Oh, hold on. It's on the floor. One minute. <laughs> Okay. So during my excitement during this, podcast. which just came out a few weeks ago, okay. Hannah Shu and the Ghost Crab Nation. Yes. By Sylvia Liu. Yes. And if you look at my website, there is a great teacher's guide for any teachers or schools out there. They have wow. like projects to make like little automatons and things like that. So, and uh, it's been wonderful to to speak to you. Uh, and to get to know you a little bit. Um, so everybody run out and buy this uh, book for any eight to 12 year olds. And even adults uh, can have fun with it too. And if you're a teacher, then certainly there's lots of, uh, lots of stuff to chew on in this book. Sylvia, it's been wonderful interviewing you. Thank you so much. Um, and I would encourage all your listeners to connect with me. I'm available online. On Twitter um, is Artsy Lou, A R T S Y L L I U. Instagram is Silu, S Y L L I U. And my uh, website is enjoyingplanetearth.com. Okay, wonderful. And you're going to write this like, uh, you know, underneath all of the Facebook and whatever. And, uh, and please share it and we'll share it to Kidlet411. Uh, you are a real hero of mine uh, oh, and, 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 and 15,000 other people. Um, and you bring the best information, uh, the best conversations. Um, people are so generous uh, with their help, their time. And at the top of this pyramid is you and Elaine uh, doing this selfless function for over a decade. Well, thank you very much. And there are so many other people who are doing the same thing and more. So we're just one little part of this entire kidlet ecosystem, let, including you. So let, 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 let me be, be uh, what's, what's the word in English? You know, the accolades are yours today. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes, there are. There are other people, but today you are in the spotlight. I know oh. you're used to having other people in the spotlight. Today you are. So Sylvia Lou, it's been wonderful to interview you. Congrats on your new book. And um, please continue with your generosity, your kindness, uh, your care about the, the world, the future. Um, and I'm just gonna say thank you. This is Mel Rosenberg for the Children's Literature Channel of the New Books Network. Thanking you, Sylvia, it's been great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. I've had a great time. <laughs> we can do this again. All you have to do is publish a new book. All right. <laughs>
All right. Bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye.